Marlow is thankful for his motley crew of friends. Those marvelous old goat men, characters all, friends over the years. You can unfriend them, but you can't disown them. History is intertwined. Now he imagines others from the Bacchanalian tribe in their godliest goat attire. With them, wives, muses, lovers, centaurs, all come for the ritual performance of the ancestral trumpet. On this day, one old goat glides his hand counterclockwise on a large glass bowl until the vibration transmutes into a strange, penetrating sound. Such a time, the real is surreal. In Marlowe's world of art, all is holy. Asked what he wanted, Marlowe said, he had all he needed. His wish was for more of the same. Deluded, enlightened, a lucky nitwit, and who gave a shit, not Marlowe. He understood it could all disappear in a flash, but he drew a line of what would not be taken away. To stand and gaze and sit and listen, to touch and smell and brood with no other end in mind than the pleasure gotten from what is gazed at, listened to, touched, smelled, or brooded upon. Marlowe knew what was needed was art to ward off fear, sickness, boredom, doubt, evil, death, decay, confusion, and unbelief. What Marlowe believed at the deepest level was the power of art. Imagination is a survival tool. Failure of imagination will leave you unprepared. Art is strange fire. Voodoo is what he was playing with. To kindle heat, to make spirits come alive. In every art project there are rules. They might not be anybody else's rules, but parameters give form. For Marlowe, it was all about the unforeseen. He wanted what he couldn't imagine. He wanted surprise, and it began bumpy as it always began. Dreams of being broke, helpless, without a job, clueless, frightened, alone. A sense of inadequacy. An airplane falling from the sky. The ensuing explosion. Looking for a safe place, holding his childhood dachshund fritz. He'd feel an intense separateness. Where did his thoughts and others align? In airports, he'd scan passing crowds, wondering how many of those people would relate to him. Not many, he concluded. This was unsettling. Then, bang, some external event rocks us. The meteor hits, and we all feel the boom. The I and the we share a commonality. Perhaps brief, but in such a moment, there is enough clarity to empower Marlowe to press forward. What did he seek? What we all seek. Our authentic self. And when he asked himself who he was, an unfiltered voice replied, a midget swallowing a goldfish. Marlowe suspected this might be true. He saw himself as a leading man in a role in which he was cast as a dachshund. He was not averse to telling his story, but he hoped to do it with some dignity. And yet, he was a dachshund. He confided to a friend, Sometimes I think I'm becoming quite mad. To which his friend replied, Marlow, you've always been quite mad. Why it hadn't until that moment dawned on him that this could be so, who could say, but he just shrugged like Maurice Chevalier and said, C'est la vie. But what he was doing, was it art? Which begged the question, what could be art? If you buy a coat rack at Ikea, and assemble it and call it a sculpture and sign it. Is it art? Sure, if Marcel Duchamp ascends from the grave to sign it. As Art Smitten said, art is what you say it is. How will you say it is the battle. Marlowe was enchanted with words. Marlowe was no poet by intention, but he made use of the conventions. In his deepest heart, he wished he could have been a songwriter in the age of Bunny and Bester. He'd write love songs. Boy meets girl, boy loses girl. She left him, he left her. Confused distances, vulnerability that touches deep. In songs, you let down the guard. You sing your joy, you sing your pain, you sing your anger, you sing your sadness. You sing from your core. Everyone loves a love song in the great American songbook. Marlowe didn't write words to music. He thought of what he did as writing words to paint. If done right, 
he wouldn't need many words to convey a depth of emotion and recognition. The game is simplicity, saying the most with the least, the honed line, the boiled down compression. It was Art Smitten who clued Marlowe in about the new imagiste, painted words, words that paint, the poem writ large, an homage to T.S. Eliot, Ezra Pound, and Hilda Doolittle. In 1926, H.D. wrote a novel, Palimpsest. Marlowe was intrigued by the word. A palimpsest is a parchment from which writing has been imperfectly erased to make room for fresh writing, but since the erasures are imperfect, the previous writing still remains partially visible. Think of graffiti. As one tagger writes over another, messages fight to be heard. The walls are always speaking. New thoughts, new ideas, multiple voices wrestling for supremacy. And then there was Ezra Pound's early book, Cathay, in which he translated Chinese poet Li Po, who was said to have drowned while trying to embrace the moon's reflection while drunk. Li Po, who wrote, with ripples like dragon scales going grass green on the water, pleasure lasting with courtesans going and coming without hindrance, with the willow flakes falling like snow, and the vermilion girls getting drunk about sunset, and the waters a hundred feet deep reflecting green eyebrows. Eyebrows painted green are a fine sight in young moonlight, gracefully painted, and the girls singing back at each other, dancing in transparent brocade, and the wind lifting the song and interrupting it, tossing it up under the clouds.